does anybody else find that they get really irritated with the Zoom messages that tell you that? It's just, I just wish that after this long, you know, especially after two and a half years of working in the pandemic, that we actually had a way of um, trying to get those Zoom warnings off. It's like, yes, I know that it's being live streamed. I'm the one who's doing it. Anyway, glad to see you guys again. Um, welcome to the last edition of Rock and Roll Book Club for 2022. I can't believe I actually made it through until the end of the year. I can't believe I read all those books. I'd have to add it up, but I think I read four, just on rock and roll. I think I've read 14 books um, alone. And uh, I'm kind of surprised at myself. I'm very pleased that I've managed to make it through. So I've made some changes for next year. Uh, the first one being that I'm going to go down to one a month, and it's going to be on the second Tuesday of every month instead of the first and third, just because number one, I talk a lot about you about using the interlibrary loan for these books, and I never do. I admit it, I'm bad. I buy them. I buy them because I love books, and I have a really really good time with the books, and uh, I just really enjoy it. And uh, my credit card's getting a little scary as a result, you know. So. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to curb that. And the other thing, too, is I want to curate the books. I think in the beginning when I was doing this, um, I started doing it with the aim of um, just like grabbing onto anything that wasn't a, a major big rock and roll book. And I knew that I didn't want to do things like Hammer of the Gods or, you know, any kind of like Long Stones biographies or anything like that. I didn't want to do something that I didn't want to tread a path that had been tread a thousand times before. So trying to find these books, which talk about these unusual angles, which approach things from different arguments and different looks and different ways of looking at things was um, something that was a bit more uh, appealing to me because I just, I, I don't do the kind of music that everybody listens to and that appeals to everybody. So it didn't make a lot of sense to want to read, you know, to, to talk about the books that everybody else would talk about. Um, and for the first year, that wasn't that hard because I could just go, oh, you know, where is this in the Amazon bestseller list? And it was about 15 or 20. That's like, okay, maybe I'll take a look at it. And also focusing on books by women and, and, and books about women as well, which there will be a lot of those in 2023. Um, but I think that, um, I need to curate it a little more evenly as opposed to just like, oh, that looks good. That looks good. That looks good. That looks good. And then ending up with like 250 books in the shopping cart and the guy from it, the delivery guy is going, do you never get out of the house? Which I'm sure they probably think about that anyway. Anyway, this is a fitting book um, to wrap up the year with, considering that this was supposed to be the first book that I started with back at the beginning of January. And I was way too ambitious <laughs> and tried to program for something. I think it was like January 4th. And for the holidays and everything, I didn't realize, and not that I didn't realize, I didn't have a proper appreciation of just what a juicy, chewy book major labels is. And I should know this because Kelly Fasana, who, who wrote the book, is the current main music critic for the New Yorker magazine, was the critic for um, the, New, uh, the New York Times for a very, very long time, I think for like seven years or something like that. I have to go back and check. And so obviously somebody who's had that many experiences and somebody who has loved music and come from a lot of different areas of appreciation of music is going to write something that's dense. So this is not a beach book unless you like your beach books really, really nerdy. It's better than that. It's something where you can go and take a look at how, just to, to name the, four, the seven genres that he's looking at, rock, R&B, country, punk, hip hop, dance and pop all mesh into one another because like every art form, nothing comes out of nowhere with rock and roll, right? Like it started with the blues and then it diverged. And it's like, there's an old, uh, back in the seventies, there was a guy named Pete Frame who used to do these like amazingly drawn family trees of bands, you know, like he would take something like television or the buggles and yes. And he would draw these beautiful, you know, bigger than 11 by 17 family trees, like an actual tree of where the groups came from and, you know, how they sprouted out and, and basically cross pollinated and worked with one another and then branched off to try new things. And that's that book. Those are, this book is basically like this family tree, those family trees, but in 480 pages of how everything comes together. The basic, the best thing I can probably say, the best metaphor 
like book metaphor I can talk about is that it's a lot like reading Stephen Hawking on rock and roll. There's this idea that the whole system has to work together. It's always drawn from one another, but at the same time, there's so much specificity and so many, there's so many cultural elements, not just from the cultures themselves that produce the rock and roll, but just even, you know, the way history, for example, um, affects uh, the way people look at rock, you know, um, for example, looking on punk, which we've done a couple of times this year on, on Book Club already, looking at how the disaffectation of the 1970s with inflation, with the Watergate scandal, with the whole thing with Vietnam, how that disaffectation basically derailed the progressive rock movement and then put, you know, pushed everyone into punk. And it did it in several markets. It wasn't like it's special. Punk just like sprouted up from New York City and, you know, bloomed everywhere else. Because at that time, of course, in 1977, there was no internet. There weren't that many music publications that you would have been able to easily get in London and in Toronto and in Australia. And yet you've got these bands all like popping up in 19, from 1975 to 1977. So there has to be something going on. Um, and this is the great thing about that book is that it's like a grand theory of everything, even though it talks about seven genres. It's a grand theory of everything about how one thing can affect another thing and affect another thing. And it's a really good book if you're the kind of person, like I kind of had to be with this one, who reads a book but then has to go back and reread it because you know that you missed it so much or you missed so much in the book that you you kind of went, hang on a second, that theory he's got about country, where does that go back with punk, you know, and the cross-pollination with that? So you're flipping back and forth. Seriously, read this with post-its because it will make your life a whole lot easier. Even though it's index, it's like read it with the you know, highlighters and pencils and stuff like that. Because it is that kind of grad school, kind of like getting your fingers dirty into the whole philosophy of stuff. The neat thing about Santa is that he's actually from West Africa. His family, his family is originally from West Africa. His father was a huge fan of the Kora, which is that kind of, uh, it almost looks like a guitar that you play backwards on your lap. And it has 21 strings, has a very big rounded body. And he talks about how the influence of his father, who was, I, I think was a, a professor of comparative religion or something like that. Um, he loved this core music that he had brought with him. And, you know, that basically served as the jumping off point for discovering so many different types of music, what it was like for Santa to be a black punk in the 1990s when let's face it, um, punk was pretty uh, punk with the exception of bands like in living color or with, excuse me, with living color, with bad brains, um, Punk's been pretty Crisco white through a lot of its existence. And to have somebody else look at it from the outside, but with an appreciative eye that tries to understand it, almost like, like an anthropologist would, as opposed to passing judgment about this is good or this is bad, which is the typical type of behavior that you would expect from um, somebody who, you know, who was a critic, you know, because critics are supposed to criticize. That's part of the job of what they do. But the, the nice thing is that really good criticism also contextualizes. It puts things in the bigger picture of being able to look at, um, you know, where does this going? Where did this come from? How does this affect other things? Um, that nice anthropological eye that he's got to be able to blend together this huge theory of everything makes for a very, very, very meaty book. I'm not going to lie. This is not something you're going to knock off in a night because I've tried. But if you do have the time to sit down and contemplatively go through each of the seven genres that he talks about, it is a really delightful read because it's almost like settling into like this big musical quilt where it's like, okay, you know, it's like, I see it now. I can see the picture that somebody else is trying to put together. So again, that is Major Labels by Califasana. It's published by Penguin Press. Um, I'm imagining this is probably available in paperback by now because I bought this, I'm going to say like October of 2021. So that was 14 months ago. And, you know, the, the book industry can move a lot quite quickly on that. But um, again, published by Penguin Press, definitely worth your time. It is a time investment. It's not, like I said, it's not something that's a quick read, but it is a worthwhile read because it gives you so much rich information that it's one of those books that you're going to keep wanting to go back to again and again and again. So thanks very much for your support and for tuning in to Rock and Roll Book Club during 2021. Or, <laughs> I don't even know what year it is anymore. You know, it's like, that's what the, pan what the pandemic's done to my sense of time. Tw thank you for tuning in for 2022. So just checking the calendar here. The first one for Rock and Roll Book Club will be on the 10th of January. And I don't even know what I'm going to do for the first book. So I'm just going to close my eyes 
and I'm going to wander over here to the bookcase. And I'm uh, January 10th is just basically going to be the book first book I pull out, and it's going to be that one. So it's have not been the same. Which I this woman's work essays on music. Okay, so we have got that one for it's set January 10th, 2023. Ooh, the monitor just went. Um, Writing that down now. I also have a lot of reading that I'm supposed to be doing for a course. I should have been doing for courses that I haven't done yet, but don't tell my teachers. This is project management stuff. <laughs> it's not It's not rock and roll in a lot of different ways. So that's it. Set. This woman's work, Essays on Music, edited by Sinead Gleason and the Kim Gordon of Sonic Youth for January 10th, 2023. Any of the books that you that we have reviewed, the um, videos are still up on YouTube. Um, I will be switching over to a subscriber model sometime in 2023. So if you've not caught any of the uh, previous editions of Rock and Roll Book Club that are available on my YouTube channel, please do so um, because I will be moving those over to a private channel um, within uh, probably by about Valentine's Day. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. There are a lot of good books and um, it's always worth discovering something new. And as always, don't forget, if you are not like me and you have more common sense about money when it comes to buying books, um, Interlibrary Loan in Ontario is your best friend. If your library doesn't have it, it can tell you which library it does and can effectuate an interlibrary loan from that one and bring it over so that you get the book for three weeks. So thanks very much again for your for tuning in. Thank you for your support. Read on, rock on, and we'll see you in the new year. By the way, the other change that I'm making for 2023 is I'm sitting down and doing these things because the amount of work that I'm going to setting up the lights for this was just like it was annoying as hell for a 10 minute thing. So I'm going to be sitting from now on, even though I sit during my jo day job. That's the other big change for 2023. But we'll come to that when, it, when 2023 actually arrives. In the meantime, I wish you a, a happy, if not bearable holiday season and all the best for the new year. Take care and thanks again for your support.